Newton lays a rather different view of the dignity of nature compared to classical Christian Western Mediterranean thought with uh, vast implications for how we view earth, plants, animals, and others with different values than ourselves. And this we will discuss uh, tonight, and I'm very eager to do this. And uh, yes, please send in your questions. But now first, we will get some music, Osa and Michael. Thank you so much. Uh, hello, John Philip. Hello, Pontus. Uh, thank you for joining us here in the Science Festival from Edinburgh. It's very good to be with you. How is the weather where you are? Oh, absolutely brilliant. Uh, spring has, has burst in Edinburgh these past uh, number of days, so we're, uh, we have uh, a wonderful emergence of color and blossom here. 
Beautiful. Well, uh, we go straight to it. Um, it's uh, commonly said that the winner uh, writes history. Um, so I wonder, um, many Celtic teachers were forbidden and excommunicated by the church. Uh, Pelagius, St. Bridget, Erigena. Uh, what resources and materials do we have to know their own thinking and not what others uh, were saying about them? Well, it, it's interesting in relation to someone like Pelagius. Um, I think uh, many of us who studied theology, uh, certainly in the Scottish context, and I think in many parts of the Western world, uh, most of us as students were required at one stage to write an essay comparing Pelagius with St. Augustine. And um, uh, we were uh, told that there were not any writings available from the hands of Pelagius. So all we could learn about him came through the mouth of his theological opponent, <laughs> which of course uh, led to a very fair analysis. Um, it, uh, it's now clear that we have many writings from the hand of Pelagius. And guess what? Uh, he was not saying what Augustine said he was saying. Um, so that, that's one uh, primary example. In, in the case of someone like Bridget, uh, who was not a writer, uh, what we have is a rich stream of, of myth and story that's been passed down in the Celtic imagination for centuries. And it's, it's interesting really just how uh, how, how deep those stories and myths run uh, within the Scottish and um, Irish psyche. Uh, so many of those stories are sort of re-emerging re um, again, and uh, primarily passed down in the oral tradition. Although again, in, uh, in the case of Bridget, some of the later lives of Bridget were written um, in, in a way to, to sort of make her acceptable to uh, medieval Catholicism. Uh, so those hagiographical accounts of, of Bridget make her sound very similar to um, saints from the non-Celtic world. Uh, so we need to move uh, deeper than some of those hagiographical accounts. And then, uh, you know, in the case of uh, a 20th century expression of of this Celtic stream uh, from the French Celtic uh, tradition, someone like Pierre Théard de Chardin. Um, he was silenced by uh, the Vatican, uh, but thank God he, uh, he agreed to an act of priestly disobedience. Um, before he died, he signed over all of his writings to his personal assistant, Mademoiselle Mortier um, in France which meant that when he died, uh, his writings were hers and, and not the church's. And uh, so we, we gained access to um, the, the wisdom of, of a great teacher, um, which uh, may well have been largely lost or fragmented if he hadn't uh, taken that, that serious decision to be disobedient to the tradition that he belonged to. Yeah, but who, uh, I, I mean, the Celts, we think of them as living in Britain, but, but uh, who were the Celts? Did they live all over Europe, uh, many tribes, one tribe? Um, who yes, are they? Um, yeah, we, we sometimes uh, think of the Celts now as uh, the people of Ireland, Scotland, Wales, Cornwall, uh, but that, that is only the fringe um, uh, at one stage, uh, from about 500 BCE, they spanned the whole of Middle Europe, uh, ranging from uh, Turkey at the eastern side of, uh, of, of Europe right through to the Atlantic coastline of Spain, uh, taking in places like uh, Galatia, uh, Galicia, uh, Gaul. All these places, uh, place names simply mean the land of the Gaels or the land of the Celts. So, uh, it, it's, it, it appears that this was an, a sort of Indo-European movement of peoples. Um, some of the fascinating links in Celtic uh, wisdom, I think, originate um, for, further east than, than Europe. But uh, certainly the Celts has, 
as they came to be named from about 500 BCE onwards, um, were, were um, spanning the whole of Middle Europe and were increasingly pushed uh, to the fringes of, of places like Scotland, Ireland, Wales, uh, as the Roman Empire expanded. Yeah. One, uh, one of the uh, thinkers that you present uh, as uh, uh, speaking about Celtic thought is Irenaeus of Lyon, uh, the church father from second century uh, France. Uh, he is also v venerated by the Catholic Church as a saint and the Orthodox Church as a saint. Uh, what, what, in his views, are Celtic, would you say? H how is he Celtic? Uh, he's, he's the first uh, historically recorded Christian teacher in Celtic territory. So he was in Gaul. Um, and... Uh, uh, his, his teacher was uh, Polycarp, and Polycarp's teacher was John. Um, and um, uh, John is much loved in the, in the Celtic world. Um, one of the, the legends or myths that, uh, uh, that speaks uh, continuously over the centuries is the story of John, the beloved, leaning against Jesus at the Last Supper. And it was said of uh, him in, in Celtic uh, myth that he therefore heard the heartbeat of God and he became a symbol of the practice of listening, uh, listening deep within ourselves, listening deep within one another, listening within the body of the earth for the beat of the sacred presence. Uh, so uh, Irenaeus can, can be seen to stand in that John tradition and uh, we, we hear in Irenaeus uh, the favorite themes uh, from the prologue to John's gospel. And uh, one of the things that we'll be exploring tomorrow in, in greater depth are some of the words of the prologue. Um, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And, and John goes on to say that everything essentially um, has been expressed into being or uttered into being. Uh, so Irenaeus um, resists uh, a tendency um, that was already developing in second century Mediterranean Christianity and which was originally, uh, eventually uh, put forward as the doctrine of creation ex nihilo, that is creation out of nothing in which it was uh, posited that a transcendent God fashioned matter out of nothing. And uh, Irenaeus says, uh, in a way that's very consistent with all the great Celtic teachers after him, he says uh, creation didn't come out of nothing. It comes out of the very substance of God. It comes out of the very womb of the one. Um, it comes out of the uterus, uh, and in that sense, it's uttered into being. Um, so uh, Irenaeus, uh, I think, very typically uh, sounds uh, a, a significant point that is picked up um, continuously then over the centuries. And, uh, of course, that uh, this uh, vision, uh, this understanding of matter has radical implications. Um, if this stuff, the stuff of the human body, the stuff of the body of the earth is sacred stuff, uh, then we can't do whatever we, we wish to it. Um, and yeah. spirituality takes on the form of reverencing uh, the human body and reverencing the, the body of the earth. Yeah. Because, and, uh, yeah, because what I understand from your writing also is that uh, one as I understand it, one reason why the, the early church didn't uh, choose uh, Celtic theology or the theology of Irenaeus and instead uh, choose the ex nihilo uh, doctrine uh, is what you say, uh, the, the marriage between the church and the empire of Rome and, and maybe also that it was more easy to enslave other territories and peoples 
with a doctrine that didn't see God as in the others in a strong way. Is that correctly understood? Uh, yes, that, that's uh, very much my, my interpretation of what was happening uh, in the fourth century and following when, um, when Christianity gets into bed with empire. Um, uh, it's a time of enormous transition. Um, and that's not to say that that it was an easy time. I mean, the, the church went from being a persecuted minority uh, to being offered power and privilege. Uh, but part of the price that I think was paid in that transaction was a more convenient teaching uh, for empire. And uh, the doctrine of, of uh, creation ex nihilo, I, I think, was one of those offerings from a convenient religion to empire. And, it, and it's, uh, it's created disastrous response, you know, d disastrous consequences throughout the Western world, and we're very much in the midst of it now. I think that link between religion and power in the fourth century is part of what has given rise to the widespread abuse of uh, the earth and matter. Yeah. And, and also one thing that I, as I understand from your writing about the Celtic thought is uh, that there was not such a strong break be, between uh, uh, the wisdom before uh, Christianity, uh, the Druidic, uh, and then uh, the uh, Christianity, but more like a mingling uh, uh, compared to where... Uh, uh, Catholic Christianity had a stronger break with uh, hedonism um, and other cultures where they came. Um, so uh, the, the Celtic teachers, uh, they recognized like all wisdom as God's wisdom and tried to bring out the good, what others had said before them. Is, is, is that how uh, you see it? Yes, uh, uh, a fifth century bard uh, in the pre-Christian um, uh, tradition, the Druidic tradition, uh, is remembered as saying there was never a time when Christ was not our teacher. Uh, we just didn't know him by name. Uh, so the, uh, there, were, there was a deep uh, and, and um, broad receptivity to Christ's wisdom in the Celtic world. Uh, and significant figures like St. Columba of Iona in the 6th century, for instance, refers to Christ as his druid, uh, uh, which is uh, to underline the radical continuity between pre-Christian thought and Celtic Christian thought. And um, we, we see it also in someone like Pelagius, again, uh, when he arrived in Rome around 400, he arrived wearing what uh, came to be known as the Celtic tonsure. So um, the, uh, the Mediterranean mission uh, styled itself in priesthood and monastic life uh, with the Roman tonsure, which was um, uh, the crown of the head shaved, but a ring of hair around it symbolizing the crown of thorns that was placed on Jesus at his trial and crucifixion. Uh, the, um, the Celtic tradition styled itself um, with what, what had been the Druidic tonsure, and that was longer hair in the middle, uh, uh, more closely shaved around the side and the back. Um, so uh, part of uh, the concern that uh, someone like Pelagius arrived in Rome was that he he was seen by Mediterranean Christianity or Imperial Christianity as arriving looking like a pagan. Yeah, and, but, and as you present uh, the discussion between Augustine and, uh, and Pelagius, uh, Augustine does not seem like a very nice guy uh, uh, in the eyes of like the Celts. Uh, and his presentation of the world as not created out of the substance of God, uh, but rather dark uh, in comparison. Uh, it, and uh, so it, is that uh, a correct view, uh, as you understand it, of the Celtic understanding of Augustine, or? Well, uh, you know, uh, Pelagius has been misrepresented uh, for centuries by, uh, by mainstream Christianity. 
And I, I don't think the way forward is to turn Augustine into the villain. Uh, but I, th I think it is important to ask, uh, what, was, what was Augustine's blind spot um, in relation to uh, Pelagius? What was he not hearing or what, what was he mishearing? And uh, I, I think uh, this misinterpretation is something that continues um, through the centuries and it continues today. Uh, I experience it as a Celtic teacher. Um, one only has to begin to speak about the essential sacredness of the human soul, the essential sacredness of the earth. And some uh, in, in our uh, traditional Western Christian inheritance will say, oh, but you're saying therefore that we don't need grace because our nature is sacred. Um, and so I think that that's a closer to uh, where what I would call Augustine's blind spot on on Pelagius, uh, and and it um, it had um, tragic consequences that that blind spot or that misunderstanding, uh, because uh, someone like Pelagius was not saying that we we didn't need grace. Um, he was saying that our nature is sacred, it's of God. It comes from the womb or the uterus of God. Um, we are made of God. Um, and he saw grace, the gift of grace, as being given to reconnect us to our nature, to, to, that we might be truly natural, and not that we, we might become something other than natural or, or more than natural. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, thank you so much, John Philip. We will soon start discussing this, but now to you, Martin. Um, uh, you're writing a book now on Augustine as well, as I uh, just learned. And uh, would you say, is this uh, an accurate uh, description of uh, uh, history, uh, the Celtic and the conflict with mainline Christianity and Augustine? Or what, what is your response to what you just heard? Well, we just heard a great deal that was enormously rich. So how I respond to what we just heard, I, I would like to know a little bit more about which particular aspect you're, you're curious about. Um, no, I mean, it, it is one of the wonderful blessings of the Christian tradition that uh, Christianity is a faith that has taken form in a whole range of different cultures and places. And the existing beliefs and practices and so on in different places have allowed different cultures and different traditions to recognize different things that are deeply true. Uh, embedded within Christian faith, and we can be very grateful for a Celtic tradition that has laid emphasis on the sacredness of the created world of human beings and the genuine gift that life is. Uh, from my perspective, uh, that, is, that is an entirely true recognition that the, we can be very grateful to the Celtic tradition for. I suppose my primary response, if we were to take that point at a very broad level, is that I'm not sure just how big a difference there is in some of those really essential ideas between a Celtic tradition on one side and a quote-unquote Western tradition on the other side. Uh, John Philip's description of, of Irenaeus and his understanding of creation is entirely right. Uh, Irenaeus does think that creation comes out of the substance of God. But in most tellings of how a theology of creation ex nihilo developed, Irenaeus is identified as one of the founding figures precisely for developing this idea. The idea of creation ex nihilo is a rejection of the idea that there is a pre-existent matter apart from God that God has to work with in forming creation. But later theologians who develop the idea more explicitly, they say exactly as Irenaeus said, that creation in some sense comes from the being of God. Creation doesn't have being in itself. It gets being by participation in God's being. So you can make Irenaeus a forerunner of a theology of creation ex nihilo as easily as you can make him uh, a kind of antithesis to it. And this idea that creation has its being through God or by participation in God's being is an, is an idea that is uh, enormously influential in a great deal of the Western tradition. And on the most influential ways of telling history today, that isn't lost in the fourth century because of empire. It's not lost with Augustine. It's still very much present in Aquinas. The most influential tellings today associate a kind of loss with the late medieval period and the Reformation. And one of the most interesting things that has happened over the last 150 years or so is a real recovery of emphasis on, uh, on the idea that creation has its being by participation in God's being. 
So my sense is that we can be, be very grateful for, to the Celtic tradition for reminding us of this, but also acknowledge that there may not be uh, a chasm between the Celtic tradition and a quote-unquote Western tradition on this so point. There could be some bridges between her, uh, yeah. the traditions. Yeah, I, I suspect that there is. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you're also uh, with English descent? Uh, do, do I, is that From right? Canada, actually, Canada. Swed mostly mostly <laughs> Swedish and Estonian descent. But yeah, yeah. But what I've learned, uh, as I understood it, it was a synod uh, in Whitby, 664, where uh, there was uh, a break uh, where the Celtic tradition was forbidden in England. Okay. Uh, is that right, or um, you, you would have to ask the one in the zoo in our in yeah. our zoo meeting who knows the Celtic tradition better yeah. than I do. No, my familiarity with seventh century English Christianity isn't enough to allow me to pr no. pronounce on on no. six sixty four. Yeah, is that right, John Philip? Uh, would you say that? Uh, that's how yes, I well, interpret uh, your writings. Yeah, uh, the, the Synod of Whitby in, in 664 was, was certainly a significant moment in, in um, the, the, the uh, pushing uh, to the side the, 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 the richness of our Celtic Christian inheritance. Um, it, didn't, it didn't, of course, uh, change everything overnight. Um, that was when an official decision was taken against the Celtic stream in Northumbria, uh, and it was King Oswy who presided over that that synod, um, and and it appears that you know he was probably influenced by power considerations, of course, because the uh, the Roman mission or the imperial mission uh, was uh, wanting to argue that uh, this is uh, this is the teaching that that. Uh, reigns throughout the entire world and uh, aspersions were made at the Celts saying it, it's only these uh, these ignorant people out on the edge of the world who are um, uh, te teaching um, uh, a, a continuity with pre-Christian wisdom uh, etc. But um, after the Synod of Whitby it, it takes hundreds of years for that decision to be implemented or imposed because the, the reality of the Celtic mission is that it didn't have one, uh, uh, one center of, of leadership. Uh, it, it styled itself on monastic communities. So there was the sort of Iona network. Uh, there was the um, Brendan network. Uh, there was the Patrick network. There was the Hilda network and so on. And um, so the, those segments of Celtic mission needed to be uh, conquered in time, but conquered they were. Uh, so by the, by the 12th century, certainly in Scotland, uh, that, that, was, uh, that m marked the end of Celtic Christianity as, as, we, as it was historically known. Um, and at that point, it sort of uh, became more of an underground movement that was carried uh, often in the prayers and simple rituals of the people. Yeah, but uh, when we talked before, uh, you said that uh, Pelagius was still like the, one of the founding saints of Britain. Uh, when we, we were talking, <laughs> how, how, how known is Pelagius in, in, in England? Uh, oh, I, I don't know. What if do you mean by that? I don't know. If, oh, what I mean by that is, is a <laughs> comment that is made so tongue in cheek that it doesn't really merit development in a context no. like this. No, it, there's a, a, it's a way of, um, it's a way of naming a cultural ethos in yeah. Britain, uh, and one that has translated even more strongly in America, a kind of pull, up yourself, pull yourself up by your bootstraps okay. uh, kind of cultural ethos. And one way, of, one way that people name that tongue-in-cheek is saying that Pelagius is the patron saint of American theology, because in American theology you just kind of you pull yourself up. But it's a comment that really is tongue-in-cheek that doesn't do justice to Pelagius, so it... No, no, uh, no, no. Yeah. No, it's I, not a comment oh. that should be allowed to carry theological weight. No, I understand. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. I, I think uh, tongue-in-cheek is maybe too mild a way to describe it, <laughs> Martin. I, I think it, it, uh, there's a, there was a lot of disrespect and misinformation behind the use of the word, the term Pelagian. Um, 
and when someone like Karl Barth, the great German theologian, says that the English are incurably uh, Pelagian, mm. uh, it, you know, he, he, he wasn't making a compliment, and neither, <laughs> neither was it just tongue in cheek. It was really um, a questioning of the of the uh, theology mm. of, of of any uh, part of the world or tradition that would affirm Pelagius. But of course. Uh, you're, I mean, you're absolutely right that the term came to be um, to be used to refer to to those who uh, believed we didn't need grace, and um, uh, of course, that's not what Pelagius taught. And um, uh, in fact, uh, um, although he is accused by uh, Augustine of saying that we don't need grace, um, Pelagius, in fact, says that there are three types of grace. There's the what he calls the grace of nature. Uh, which is to say that everything is grace. Um, this very moment, our breath, the sun is sort of uh, coming in my window here, the birth of our children, it's all gift, it's all uh, grace. Um, so uh, he uses it that way. He says also there's the grace of illumination when, when our eyes are washed, as it were, um, in order to see again the sacredness of one another, to see the sacredness of the creatures and the earth. And then there's the third grace that he refers to, which is the grace of forgiveness, uh, when we have wronged uh, another, uh, when we have failed or betrayed the other. Um, uh, there's the grace of forgiveness, uh, which is given to allow us to begin again, to allow us to to live from our true essence uh, of God. Um, so um, it, it's been a tragic misunderstanding, uh, and, it, and it continues today. I, I think most theological students in our Western seminaries um, graduate with that understanding of, of Pelagius. Thank you. Uh, we will continue the discussion later uh, and go on. But now to, I, I turn to you, uh, Petra. Uh, welcome. You are on link here from uh, Stockholm. Thank you. Yeah, you are the associate professor in theology there. And um, I wonder what's your comments and reactions to this presentation on Celtic uh, spirituality? It's been wonderful to listen and it's wonderful to read uh, John Philip Mill's work. So I, I really do recommend that. Uh, and uh, there are just so many ideas coming to mind from uh, hearing your discussion and also from, from uh, listening to you, the way you answer the questions. And, and I was thinking uh, right now in relation, to, in relation to what Martin said uh, about the likeness of uh, of the different traditions of the different Christian traditions in in Europe, and I I I guess that is true in many ways that that we do see uh, some some thinkers are being claimed by many different traditions, and we do see that there are traces of different bits and pieces of wisdom that we kind of dig up in different times when when we need different kinds of wisdom, uh, but I'm. But I, I think that right now I would like to kind of push more on the difference uh, and and just to, to be able to think about that more thoroughly because I I sense that we are in a time like politically and and ecologically where we are in desperate need of of new interpretations and new narratives and I find that um, teachers like the, the Celtic teachers and and other teachers are kind of reminding us of the other voices. We, I, I think that we feel like our civilizations have, have for so long been reaching for the sky and kind of been trying to learn how to fly rather than how to ground. And so we've been kind of heading upwards and, and now it's kind of this Icarus story where we've flown too close to the sun and, and suddenly we're, we're, we're going down and, and we're kind of def desperately seeking new narratives and, and we are listening more to indigenous peoples and those kind of wisdoms and, and uh, you invite a, a Celt <laughs> kind of teacher, a Celtic teacher. Uh, and, but then, of course, we could also start wondering 
but is that the other or or are we still like are we still uh, are we just creating this kind of dualism of wanting the the other to come and save us kind of thing and and are we not always also part of the empire and also part of the power and whatever church we build i mean you're sitting there martin and 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 uh, pontus i see you now in the, with this beautiful golden kind of altar in the middle like uh, the the is a church of power in that sense kind of being materialized in that room uh, and still you're aiming for something different so i i i guess i just want to talk about that kind of the risks and possibilities in talking about kind of twisting the narrative and turning to something else and to to reject power empire and to invite something else how how, how do your thoughts go in, in relation to to that no john philip i think uh, um one of the things I've tried to do, uh, even in looking at uh, the debate at the Synod of Whitby, um, where the Mediterranean or the Imperial Mission appeals to the authority of Peter um, as, as the, the rock on, on which uh, Jesus promised to build the church. And, um, and of course, the, the place of Peter imagery in, in uh, Mediterranean Imperial Christianity. The spokesperson for the Celtic mission, on the other hand, uh, appeals to the authority of John um, and uh, uh, speaks of John as the one who leaned against Jesus uh, at the Last Supper and heard the heartbeat of God, the sort of the much more mystical and uh, uh, interior uh, attentive uh, focus. And uh, part of what I, uh, I try to wrestle with in, in that uh, that historical story is the fact that we we need these we need these two ways of seeing, and um, and it, it's important not to not to demonize the other um, the way uh, someone like Pelagius ha has tragically been demonized, and and the response at this moment in time is not to try to turn the tables. It's um, it's to say. Um, what, what are the strengths of, of, uh, of a Peter tradition? Um, uh, what, what are the strengths about outward structure? Um, you know, m many of us at, at this time uh, in, in the playing out of the Christian story, many of us uh, live in a type of diaspora. Um, we, we live in a type of spiritual exile and um, sometimes that, that is literal uh, in terms of so many of my brothers and sisters will not enter the four walls of the church anymore because, um, because they're not feeling fed by and nurtured and they're not, they're not uh, hearing a deep and radical affirmation of sacredness of the earth and sacredness of the feminine. Um, and. Uh, so I, th I think it's interesting that, that, that uh, where so many of us have ended up is, is um, yes, wanting to be attentive like John to the sacred, the beat of the sacred deep within, uh, but we end up sort of uh, longing for some sort of outward structure, an outward community. So I, I think it's, it's very important um, it is such a critical time in the history of the earth uh, and in also the unfolding of, of our uh, Christian stream of wisdom. It's far too important and critical a time to be uh, losing one another or to be moving simply into judgment of the other. Um, so it's this attentiveness to, um, uh, and, and I think one of the tensions that comes between the Celtic and the Imperial or Mediterranean is that the Celtic ha is focused on the imminent, the within. Um, and, and there's a great sense of the transcendent in, in the uh, Mediterranean, the otherness, the more thanness uh, of, of the divine. And that, that for me is a good example of we, we need both. Um, and I, I think that's 
you know, that's why the Celtic tradition in speaking of the sacredness and the imminence of the divine has often been accused of, of pantheism. Um, and I, uh, th that to me is an incorrect description of what these Celtic Christian teachers were pointing to. They didn't lose a sense of the otherness, um, but I think that's what we're in danger of, of, of uh, losing the, uh, the integration of the so-called opposites. Um, and um, I'm, I'm ent entirely um, uh, at one with, with someone like Carl, Carl Jung, who says that wholeness is to be found through an integration of the opposites, um, and whether that's the masculine and the feminine, whether it's heaven and earth, whether it's spirit and matter and so on. Yeah, it also reminds me of uh, Nicholas Cusa and his uh, coincidentia at Oppositorum. Yes. But now I was also kind of curious to ask you about the practices then, because if we do still see some kind of differences in, in these different traditions, what, what, what differs as it come, when it comes to Christian practice? Because you were uh, also in the beginning uh, referring to this listening and listening to the heartbeat. Um, from from the John tradition, but also relating to to how we uh, inhabit the earth. What? How does that come forth in a Christian life? In a Celtic Christian life? Yes, um, we, we we were speaking, uh, Petra, before we sort of uh, began here about the significance of Iona. Uh, in my own journey and um, the pilgrimage weeks that we have on Iona every year. And um, there, there is teaching at, at those, those weeks, um, but I think a, a sort of equally and maybe even more important dimension of it is, is the exploration of spiritual practice and um, creativity around spiritual practice and creativity around rituals. I think we're, I think we're really hungry for rituals that make this connection back to the sacredness of the earth or back to the sacredness of the feminine or these dimensions that have been lost in a, a sort of masculine dominated transcendent focused uh, religious inheritance. Uh, so I, th I think uh, on the practice front, um, I, I, I so love what someone like Thomas Berry uh, says, uh, eco-theologian Thomas Berry and uh, one of the things he says about ri ritual is that it, we, we almost need to play, play our way forward uh, so that it's not as if um, we know exactly what, what the symbolism means uh, before we use it. Um, we can allow ritual around uh, the four elements of earth, air, fire, water. We can allow playful uh, development of ritual around north, south, east, west, and um, to, to help ground us again, to help uh, orient us again uh, back into the sacredness of the earth. So I, I think the practice piece, is, it's not as if, you know, we work it out uh, theologically and, and then we sort of uh, mold the practice. I, I think that it, it's in and through the, the um, playful, imaginative uh, use of ritual and practice that that our thinking uh, and and our theology and perspective will be clarified and challenged. Yeah. yeah so that thinking is also taking place in substance rather than in, in nothing, so to say. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Actions. Well. I, well, thank you both. We will, we, yeah, we will soon. Uh, we will uh, continue this discussion. But speaking of practices, we uh, we now have uh, uh, some music from our musicians here, uh, and then we come back to the discussion later after that. Great.
Thank you, Osa and Martin. Um, well, we don't have uh, many hours to discuss all these things, so I will um, press on here. Uh, another subject which uh, connects to the Celtic thinking is uh, the, the idea of the divine feminine. And if I uh, remember correctly, Roman, th Roman historians wrote before Christianity about the Celts as being a little bit weird uh, because they uh, did not have temples for their gods. They worshipped in the woods. And also they venerated uh, the divine feminine. Uh, so um, let's talk a little bit about that. What... what uh, what did they mean with this? Uh, I mean, Romans uh, also had uh, female gods. So what, so what disturbed them or what fascinated them with the divine feminine, would you say, John Philip? Yes, I, I, I think it's interesting that these um, criticisms uh, of, of the Celtic world. And, uh, and this was not just sort of pre-Christian, this, this was actually in the second century, these accounts of, of the Celtic world um, with reference to um, the, the Celtic Christian community in, in uh, Gaul as well. Um, I think it's interesting that these criticisms are, are, all, are offered almost in the same breath. Uh, one is saying, uh, they're irreligious, they don't have temples there. And, and this was because uh, they were, they were um, worshiping or uh, uh, cherishing, adoring the, the divine in the mountains and the hills. Um, and so it's an earth reference. And, uh, uh, and almost in the same breath, they're saying, uh, the, these these Celts honor the feminine uh, and they honor the place of, of women um, because the the forgetting uh, of the sacredness of the earth and the forgettingness of forgetting the sacredness of the feminine have uh, have gone hand in hand um, what we have done to the body of the earth is often what we've done to the the body of the feminine or the, and the body of women uh, so th there it is happening, um, you know, in the Roman context as well. Um, so I, I think that's the primary reference, Pontus. It, it's to what is actually happening in second century um, Gaul as well as to the pre-Christian. But uh, clearly there's, there's continuity. And one of the really uh, continuity between the pre-Christian and the Christian. And one of the really significant uh, um, transition um, figures is in fact Bridget of Kildare. Um, she, um, it appears that she was a druid, um, and and not only a druid um, priestess, but the the leader of the the primary druidic community in Ireland. Um, and uh, when she comes to see Christ as her druid, uh, she really brings not only an entire community, but but much of much of Ireland into um, a confluence of uh, reverencing of Christ 
and uh, indebtedness to pre-Christian wisdom. Um, and some of the rituals that had, had uh, been cherished for centuries in a place like Kildare in Ireland, the, the keeping of the perpetual fire to point to the earth goddess uh, and the light that will not be overcome by darkness. Uh, that, that ritual is, is continued for nearly a thousand years into the Christian uh, era uh, before the fire is uh, violently extinguished uh, in the 16th century by Protestant reformers. Yeah. So, and, and Petra, do you, what's your ideas about this uh, divine uh, feminine? Uh, I mean, in, in Christianity, we are not, uh, most people would say that we have a male god, or uh, what's your response to this? Uh, the, the, the Celtic uh, veneration of the divine feminine, uh, how, how does that, how is that new or, or differ from classical ideas of God? Oh, we have, we've had for a long time, uh, of course, and I think in Sweden it has been really influential, the feminist uh, theology uh, that have been uh, very concretely working on our images of God in, in the church handbooks and so on uh, by trying to make that kind of language more inclusive and, and kind of broadening the the way we talk about God and, and adding a, a female feminine aspect. Uh, and then there are also <laughs> the kind of compulsory jokes made about that or the, the, the comments about that not being making a, a big difference. But I do think just just as just as in the way that uh, well thinkers have been talking about the way in which Christianity have been uh, detaching itself from from nature so that you 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 cannot uh, venerate a, a tree because it's not holy in itself i mean even it may be a reflection of god or just like lynn white jr wrote uh, like uh, to a christian a, a tree is nothing more than a physical fact and although that isn't entirely true there is still that kind of uh, there is still a point to it that as long as you don't see an an actual presence of God or an actual divine authority uh, in uh, in a plant, in a tree, or in a female or black body, um, then uh, you will you will also see uh, that that kind of presence as someone needing your salvation or needing grace or, or needing <laughs> needing a kind of addition of the holy rather than something actually expressing the holy. And so I, I do think that makes a difference, although I, I also re react in a way that kind of when you speak about the divine feminine that then I sense kind of aha so so that's my place in, in this thinking kind of thing that's the place for my kind of body and then the other the other parts is not but but I mean that is not entirely uh, I don't think that's uh, the way that the Celtic spirituality works but but it but it also I mean it also rings that it, it's reminds me of those ways of thinking and those critiques that say that, yes, but we, I mean, as long as we don't also talk about the male as something particular, uh, then the feminine will always be the particular, representing the other anyway. So, uh, so, so that is both a kind of one partly a critique, but also uh, underlining the importance of, of a divine feminine. Yeah. And Martin, what's your comments on the divine feminine? Is that uh, something that we have in, in classical Christianity as well? Or is this like a more specific uh, uh, part of Celtic mm. tradition? Um, well, it depends a good deal. I mean, there are a lot of different ways to talk about what the divine, divine feminine would, would mean. Uh, if the connection is between a veneration of the feminine and a veneration of the earth, then it's probably less common in what we could maybe very loosely call a, dom call a dominant Western tradition. If by it we mean a symbol of a kind of spiritual posture, if we mean it as a symbol of a kind of spiritual posture of receptivity or something, then that, that is an idea that is much more present. The uh, 
a figure who is commonly identified as the, the quote-unquote father of modern theology, a man named Friedrich Schleiermacher, the emphasis of his spirituality was on receptivity, on a recognition of a form of dependence that is absolute, and that leave, leaves us needing to be uh, kind of receptive all the way down. So the divine feminine can be construed in a lot of different ways, many of which would have resonances with ideas that are, that are present throughout the tradition. Uh, but we can be, again, be grateful to the Celtic tradition for the particular emphases that it, that it brings to the question. Oh. Thank you. Another subject that is interesting, that is like highly debated between uh, Pelagius and Augustine, is the idea of grace. Uh, and you were uh, commenting a little bit about that, um, John Philip, before. Um, and uh, uh, what, what, what would be your response to this? You, you know, uh, Augustine's uh, definition of grace in contrast to the Celtic understanding um, as mm. something more that, that really uh, transforms us as beings, uh, as I understand the Augustinian view um, compared to the Celtic, which uh, re, uh, helps us to reconnect with who we are. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, in one sense, that is a deeply Augustinian idea. Uh, Augustine is one of the forerunners of, th of the later classically Catholic notion that, that grace restores and perfects nature, that grace is the perfection of nature. Uh, I mean, Augustine thinks that what is most deeply true about us is the presence of God in us. God, he, he, will, con he will consistently say, is uh, more inner to me than my innermost, nearer to me than my nearest, and so on. Uh, and grace is uh, a gift that allows you to return to that which is most inner to, most inner to you and most proper to you. Um, to my understanding, and, and John Philip, you're welcome to push back against this, from Augustine's perspective, where the rubber really meets the road in his debates with Pelagius has to do with the relation between grace and justice. Uh, you were saying earlier that uh, Augustine uh, depicted Pelagius as saying that grace was not necessary. And that's at least not the understanding that I've come away from Augustine with. Uh, when I have read Augustine, Augustine says, uh, of course Pelagius says you need grace uh, as the beginning of, of a gift of justification. Grace sort of gets things started. But that Pelagius will then say justification has to come at some point also as a result of an element of human merit. There does have to be an element of human working. And from Augustine's perspective, Pelagius says this because Pelagius says it would be unjust if God gave justification without there being some element of human merit. God would be unjust if justification were given uh, on the basis of grace alone, because there is some kind of mismatch between justice and grace. And what Augustine wanted to suggest is that actually justice and grace go hand in hand in a really important way, that it can be just for God to give justification on the basis of grace alone. And from my perspective, this is a point that's important not just as a kind of historical matter, but also how we think about uh, some of the questions that you were raising earlier, Petra. You talked about the risks and possibilities involved in kind of twisting the narrative and exploring different perspectives and so on. And my own sense is that one thing that Augustine is doing here is twisting the narrative pretty dramatically. Our social practices are built around the idea that justice and grace are in some ways antithetical that to act in grace is to sort of put justice off to the side, and that to mete out justice is to say, no, we can't be gracious in this instance, we have to do what is just. But I think one thing that Augustine is doing is pushing us pretty hard to think about whether justice and grace really are antithetical, or whether in a world in which we are prone to forgetting the sacredness of each other, whether in a world in which we have difficulty remembering that God is present to all of us, whether actually to break some of these cycles, we need to recognize that justice works by way of grace, and justice creates the possibility for its own existence by aligning itself with a work of grace. So from my perspective, I wonder if it's that question of a kind of fit between justice and grace that is most, that is most important in thinking about the debate between, between Augustine and Pelagius, and about what that debate means today mm -hmm. as we wrestle with ecological crisis, systematic oppression, and so on. Mm -hmm. Do you want to comment on that, uh, John Philip? Yeah, uh, a, a interesting point, Martin. Thank you. Um, I, I, um, I think that uh, because Pelagius has has a more um, dignified or um, noble noble conception of human nature, then uh, he he. He calls us to access 
those energies uh, deep within our nature, um, the wisdom uh, that is with us, made, made of God, um, the creativity that, that is within us. Um, and uh, p- part of the debate, uh, as I understand it, between Augustine and um, Pelagius is that um, Pelagius didn't, didn't mind uh, uh, t- taking quite literally Jesus' words, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Um, uh, whereas that, uh, the, the way, the, the way uh, Pelagius uh, or Augustine responds to that is, is suggesting that Pelagius believes we, we somehow have the capacity to be perfect. I, I think he's, um, uh, he's not uh, pointing to uh, uh, perfection uh, so much as um, the, the need to access uh, the God-given energies and uh, passion and uh, compassion and desire for justice that, that are in us, made in the image of God. Um, and uh, I, I think that uh, Pelagius is, is demanding more of, of our human nature because he has, he has a more reverent or sacred understanding of, of what that is. So I think that there's much more emphasis on, uh, on, on what our responsibility is. I mean, Pelagius didn't win any friends in, in the Roman hierarchy by saying that the, the wealthy are causing more deaths in this world than the cruelest murderer um, because the, they're not um, uh, justly sharing uh, the resources of the earth. And that uh, just as nature, just as grace is sacred, so nature is sacred. Just as we share the elements at the sacrament of, of grace, the bread and the wine, he says, so we should be sharing justly the, uh, the elements at the, at, the, at the sacrament of nature. Well, thank you. Do you want to comment, Petra, on, on uh, grace? We can talk about grace for a long time. <laughs> I was, Comment but, on grace. <laughs> <laughs> the grace issue or justice, uh, what they said now. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm thinking of, uh, of what you just said uh, last now, uh, John Philip, that, and about the reception of grace and how it comes into our life. And that also, I think, relates to uh, a thought I had earlier on that I, I reconnected to. Uh, when you talk about the Christ figure or Jesus figure, uh, what kind of role grace has and where it appears and where it comes to us, because I think that there is a kind of break with the exclusive kind of notion. It sounds more as if the grace is uh, is a function, the Christ is a function that can, can come to us in well, perhaps like non-human or, or <laughs> different kind of organic kind of mediators of, of grace or Christ. And, and that, that, of course, then also makes a difference in, in, in the kind of e- equation kind of thing, the kind of mathematical uh, uh, law thinking that has been such a big and important part of, of classical theology where where it's kind of a calculation that is supposed to to add up and it's supposed to <laughs> kind of even out in the end um and and yeah so i i think i want to hear you say something more about that where can we uh, experience grace and and what is christ and the christ figure in that related to that <clears throat> yes thank you um uh, one of the things we'll be exploring uh, in greater uh, depth uh, with, with a bit more time tomorrow is um, uh, the, the, uh, the emphasis in the Celtic tradition that comes across uh, again and again is that uh, we have forgotten who we are. Um, uh, uh, the 9th century teacher John Scottish Eugenia says we suffer from soul, soul forgetfulness. Um, we have forgotten our, our, the essence of our nature um, as, as of God, as sacred. And uh, he sees Christ as our memory um, uh, coming to wake us up. Um, so he doesn't see, see Christ as uh, embodying um, 
a foreign truth, but rather disclosing the deepest truth. Um, that is the truth that is at the heart of you and me and of every human being and, and of everything that has being. Um, uh, so he's, he speaks of Christ as, as our revelation. And of course, you know, revelation comes from the Latin word revelare, which means to lift the veil. So he, he sees um, the Christ figure as lifting the veil. And uh, to show us our Christhood or to show us that uh, intermingling of the divine and the human of spirit and matter um, that is at the heart of each one of us. Uh, and, and again, the, the journey of repentance or the, uh, the journey of turning from what is false um, is about uh, returning to, to uh, the very heart of our, our nature. Um, and, uh, and one of the things I'd, I'd like to get into a bit tomorrow again is, is that the essence of our nature holds both the feminine and the masculine. I, I, I think it's, it's, it's really uh, important not to see the feminine limitedly in, in terms of female. I mean, there is a reverence of women in leadership historically in the Celtic tradition, but I think they're pointing to something uh, deeper and closer to the essence of the sacred um, when they speak about a marriage or a dance or a love of the feminine and masculine deep within each one of us and deep within our communities and deep within the world. Yeah, thank you. We are now, uh, we have received several questions uh, from people listening to this discussion. So uh, we will now turn a little bit to those questions. Um, and uh, I, I'm not really under, sure if I understand this question, uh, but I will read it up and, and you're free to comment, John Philip and Petra and Martin as well. But um, uh, it's about the pre-Christian cultures in general. Uh, they're wondering uh, why we here discuss uh, the difference between Celtic Christianity and uh, and, and uh, mainline Christianity, and uh, uh, that that the pre-Christian cultures did not believe in free will and did not classify m mystical beings into good and evil. Uh, well, for me, I'm not sure if this even is true, but I don't know. Uh, what, what would your comments on free? Uh, Christian uh, ideas about good and evil and mystical beings be? Uh, John Philip. Um, in, in the Celtic context, um, uh, part of the challenge, of course, is that the, the pre-Christian uh, world or the pre-Christian context was an oral cultural, an oral culture, not a, a literary culture. Um, so we don't have written um, uh, expressions of, of pre-Christian Celtic uh, wisdom. Um, by the time a written um, documentation or expression uh, happens, and it seems that Pelagius was perhaps the first uh, British uh, Celtic writer. Um, uh, so by the, by the time we get written accounts of what, what was happening in the pre-Christian world, um, then it's coming through. It's coming through a Christian lens. Um, now that's not that's not always a negative lens, as as I've tried to um, point to. It's often it's often a lens that really cherishes the, the pre-Christian. Um, and I uh, I uh, would be surprised if if what someone like Pelagius or Bridget um, brought with them from the pre-Christian world was, was a sort of lack of, of, of belief in, in free will um, uh, uh, or a, a, a diminishing of, of the significance of the will. I think that, 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 that this, in fact, is part of the sense of the dignity or sacredness of, of, the, uh, of human nature, that we have this capacity to choose. Um, and, uh, and above all, we, we have the capacity to choose to love, or uh, we can choose not to love. Uh, we can choose not to forgive. Um, and uh, the very uh, essence of the celebration of love comes, uh, comes close, of course, to the mystery of love, um, because 
the, um, you know, w would I want my children to, to love me um, because it was simply their nature and they couldn't do anything other than love, love me. Um, when my children love me, it's a gift to me because they've chosen, you know, they've chosen to be true to the way of, to the way of love. And I think it's that, that emphasis that we often hear in someone like Pelagius. Oh. Do you want to comment on the pre-Christian cultures? Any one of you, uh, Martin, and this idea? Uh, Petra? <laughs> or we press on here? Or did I see uh, you nodding, uh, Petra, or no? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, another question from the, the audience here is, uh, how might we differentiate uh, Celtic Christianity from white nationalism? in a time when populist movements are emphasizing Euro-American culture over diversity of culture? I had to read that question for myself several times before reading it out. But did you understand the question? Uh, should I read it again? I'd be happy to hear it, hear it again, yes. Yeah, Thank you. yeah. How might we differentiate Celtic Christianity from white nationalism in a time when populist movements are emphasizing Euro-American culture over diversity of culture? Well, I don't know. Do yes, um, I, I think that um, very, very clearly uh, uh, one of the things that we hear and uh, is to the fore in someone like Pelagius' <clears throat> teaching is that is that we are looking to uh, celebrate and adore, to cherish, to protect uh, uh, the the light of the divine uh, deep within every expression of, of the divine, um, and and not um, simply an expression of the divine that is limited to our culture or our religion. Um, uh, the, um, I don't know of any particular reference to race in Pelagius, um, but I, um, we, we do have references in Pelagius to how we are to honor uh, the wisdom in, in those of other, of, of other religions and, um, and in, in uh, especially a pre pre Christian religion, so it's forever um, looking beyond any of the boundaries that we've tried to uh, establish or erect between us and the other, or between the, the between races, or between religions, or between genders. Yeah. Thank you. Uh... Another question is, uh, how would, uh, if everyone now would turn Celtic, uh, apart from the, the hairstyle thing, um, uh, how, how would ordinary people notice uh, if we are all became more Celtic? Um, any ideas about that? Uh, John Philip first, and then the other. <laughs> Yeah, um, well, uh, w one of the things I, I, I like to try to be clear about is that I'm not advocating a, a sort of Celtic fundamentalism. <laughs> I'm, I'm not saying that we all need to become Celtic. Um, I'm uh, always wanting to say that there's great treasure in this, in this stream of wisdom that has been neglected, and, uh, and there's much... Um, there's much treasure in the stream for this moment in time, um, in the midst of the, uh, the growing earth consciousness and earth awareness that we're in the midst of, and that this moment is, is beckoning uh, or calling for or crying for. Um, so I, I think that um, if we were to uh, incorporate um, and more strands of this wisdom tradition uh, into uh, into our Western Christianity, or if we were to learn uh, from this earth reverencing tradition uh, in, in generally in our spiritual practices today, then I think that one of the things we would see is is a greater attentiveness uh, to not only an awareness of the earth, 
but a desire to be part of her healing. Um, and um, uh, the, the, the movement from, um, from thought and belief and ritual into action, I think that the Celtic tradition is again and again uh, inviting us to see that flow between how we perceive one another, how we perceive the earth, and how we treat one another, and how we care for the earth. Hmm. Uh, and another idea in your writings, uh, when you present Celtic uh, ideas, is nonviolence. But, but I, I wonder. Um, I mean, the, Celt the Celtic, uh, I don't know, the Celtic Christians or the Celtic world had slaves too and uh, were fighting wars, uh, as I understand it. Uh, but how, how is this more non-violence uh, a Celtic thing uh, and not our modern uh, idea of or value? Um, yes, the... Um the relationship between um, sacredness and, and how we handle and how we are in relationship to the sacred. Um, uh, in, certainly in later uh, Celtic teachers like George MacLeod of, of Iona, uh, the, the, the nonviolence um, emphasis becomes absolutely explicit and, and really becomes pretty essential uh, if we view the other, uh, if we view the earth as sacred, um, then that, uh, in a thinker like George MacLeod, and, and I entirely agree with it, that, that translates into how we act in relation to the other. Um, it also um, uh, expresses the, the, the vision that... Um, the way forward is to bring the essence of my being into a relationship with the essence of your being and the essence of other beings so that we, um, there's no real change or deep change that can happen through force, but rather through, um, through the, the meeting and reverencing of my center with your center or the, the center of my nation with the center of another nation. Uh, in terms of really honoring uh, the dignity and well-being and, and, and knowing that, uh, that this pretending that uh, my nation can be well while, it, while abusing or um, dominating another nation. Um, so uh, some, of, some of that can be traced back to earlier strands, but I don't think that there's any indication that I'm aware of, and someone like uh, Pelagius, that that there that there is um, a clearly defined pacifism in that tradition. In fact, uh, th there are um, some stories of, about of violence breaking out, sometimes even between monastic communities. There are, there are fights that occurred over copyright of who who uh, whose uh, scriptures could could be copied and accessed by different communities, pathetic um, uh, um, uh, cases, cases of violence erupting. Um, uh, but uh, nevertheless, I'd want to say that deep in, deep in this tradition uh, is the sense of the sacredness of the other uh, has a profound impact, uh, impact on, on how we relate to the other. Yeah. Thank you so much. I think that would be, uh, maybe will be our concluding uh, remarks uh, from this discussion. Uh, or Petra, do you want to have any last uh, words here? <laughs> or Martin as well, comments or, uh, yeah. No, I, I think I wanted to, re to relate back on just to, to emphasize what I think could happen if, if we would listen more kind of in, include or invite also the Celtic thinking as a part of the Christian thinking, uh, which relates to the notion of sacredness, which is not uh, um, limited to what we perhaps normally think of as a kind of sacred idea, as a kind of sacred feeling in the church, or, or, or uh, but actually broadened. And, and I think 
uh, I've been working well with the church handbook and also with my students who are becoming pastors and priests and who are writing their sermons. And I note that it takes a, a, a big effort for them to be to be able to invite uh, nature, <laughs> other uh, other organisms, just in, into the way that they preach and into the church room, because. Uh, the relations that are in focus there and in the way that we uh, live our church life is God, me, and my fellow uh, humans, <laughs> and and that's it. And and I and I do think that if we would broaden our sense of the sacred, uh, it would also come more natural for us to invite uh, more of reality and more of creation uh, into the way that we worship. And I think that would be really important. Yeah, thank you. Any last words from you, Martin, here? No, I think at this point it's just to, to say a sincere word of thanks to you, John Philip, for joining us this evening and for, for sharing the rich wisdom of your tradition with us. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. And thank you so much, Martin. Thank you, Petra. And thank you, John Philip. And thank you, everyone who has been listening and sending in questions. Tomorrow, we will have uh, the topic is uh, existential health or spiritual health, li uh, living well and dying well with a professor from uh, Karolinska Institute and uh, also a professor from Gothenburg University and others. Uh, most welcome tomorrow. Now we uh, conclude here with some music. Thank you all. Thank you.